Richard Stone has painted portraits of the royal family for almost five decades. At the age of 22, he became the youngest royal portrait artist since 1790. He's completed commissioned portraits of Queen Elizabeth II, the Queen Mother, Princess Margaret and King Charles III, as well as Princes Philip and Andrew. His portraits hang at Buckingham Palace, the National Portrait Gallery in London and the National Portrait Gallery in Australia. Australia and he's on the line with us here and where are you at the moment is this your fancy portrait studio well I wouldn't necessarily describe it as fancy <laughs> but it is my studio is my everyday workplace so what's it like spending presumably hours and hours in the same room as somebody so significant like the Queen or members of the royal family and prime ministers one has to work hard on one's own nerves to be honest mm. but I suppose I'm Unsurprisingly, the atmosphere is very businesslike. I'm there to paint a portrait and the Queen is expecting a good portrait from me. So both of us have to take the occasion very seriously. Um, the Queen would, aw- would arrive, um, often is not dressed for the sitting in the, the robes in which she's going to be depicted. And she will say, Mr. Stone, what would you like me to do? And so her purpose is very serious, as is mine. I've got a palette in my left hand and a brush in my right. And she's expecting me to start work immediately. So we get down to work pretty quickly. And do you feel a particular pressure when you're painting, particularly the Queen, I suppose, because everybody knows what the Queen looks like. So you've kind of got to get it perfect. You are so right, but that's the challenge. Mm. Now, her face is was so familiar to all of us. Yeah. But of course, I'm there in her presence and I have the, the luxury, the privilege, if you want, of being able to slowly get to know her as a real person. Mm. And I think my job as a portrait painter is inevitably to get a good likeness. So that's the first stage. But the second, and that's probably the most difficult bit, is trying to capture something of the Queen's personality. Mm. How do you actually capture a personality? Because for people that don't do portraits, it sounds a bit mad to get a personality from a picture. I mean, it's very elusive. And to be honest, Mm. you can't sort of say, oh, hold the pose, Your Majesty. I Mm. just want to sort of get a little bit of, um, I don't know, steadfastness or whatever into the picture, Um, Mm. or a little bit of humour or whatever. It is something that just sort of evolves. But I... I suppose the fact that I'm building up a portrait over a significant period of time Mm. and I'm seeing all sorts of facial gestures, I'm beginning, if you want, to distill aspects of someone's expression and the way that they are using their face to express themselves, if you want, the way that they are, are sitting and relaxing that you, often as not by luck more than anything else, um, hope that you will recognise that specialness that is unique to that person. And is there ever a pressure to paint what the sitter or the general public would expect it to look like? Or do you just try and paint what you see? I try to be very honest, but as the sitter, regardless of who the sitter is, is always encouraged to see the progress and actually to view the whole project as something we are working on together, a partnership, if you want. They trust me, and um, I'd like to think that um, they enter into the spirit of the sittings of Mm. allowing me to see a little more of themselves and they may want to show at a social occasion. I've said that they're business-like, but they're they're often quite relaxed. Um, I encourage conversation. And people then become less self-conscious. They're less aware of having to sit for a portrait and definitely less aware of being stared at because at the end of the day, that's what I'm doing. I'm staring, looking at the detail in someone's face. Yeah. That it can so easily be desperately self-conscious. 
Mm. And I worked very hard to remove that element from the sittings. Yeah, I think that's quite important, isn't it? Because apart from anything else, it can be quite boring for them to sit for perhaps an hour and a half. You're so right. <laughs> yeah. um, the last thing one wants is to paint someone who is bored and just is counting <laughs> then the minutes until the end of it. Yeah. I mean, it's always a huge compliment when the, the 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 queen will look at her watch and say, "Goodness, where did the time go?" Yeah, and I hope she meant that in a genuine way, and not, "Oh my <laughs> goodness, how many more sittings have we got to go?" Yeah. So, where did your interest in portraits come from originally? Because I understand it's actually back when you were only four years old. Oh, I mortified my parents yeah. when I was four. It was a birthday treat to be taken to London to see the sights. And we ended the day by standing outside Buckingham Palace. And whatever possessed me, I grasped the railings and said quite loudly, I'm going to paint the Queen. Yeah. My parents were so embarrassed. I was immediately bribed with the promise of an ice cream, and we all went home rather early, I think. Yeah. But where that dream, that ambition came from, I really don't know. But 35 years later, I was standing in the yellow drawing room at Buckingham Palace, overlooking the mall on those very railings, wow. in the presence of the Queen, with my paintbrush and my palette, ready to start her portrait. Could you quite believe that at that point? Was that a bit of a pinch me moment? Well, it was a, certainly a goosebump moment, yeah. but it wasn't, of course, my first experience of painting a royal portrait. Um, the Queen Mother, many years previously, and in your introduction, you said that how young I was when she had seen my work and plucked me from obscurity and gave me this wonderful opportunity to paint her portrait. And as a result of that, I ended up painting six portraits of her during her life. Wow. And she introduced me to so many important people, including her family. And having painted royal portraits now for 50 years, and I really find that so hard to believe, I'd already painted quite a few members of the royal family by the time I got to painting the Queen's portrait. So yeah. I was used to being in the presence of terribly important people, but yeah. clearly it was a huge challenge to paint the portrait that I had long dreamt of painting. Yeah. And how did you first get in contact with the Queen Mother? Because I imagine she would have been quite difficult to get hold of. You'll probably find it hard to believe, but I telephoned her. <laughs> and you could get through to Clarence House in those days quite easily. Well, Clearly, she wasn't going to pick up the phone. Yeah. But one of her courtiers did and um, was surprised that I should telephone asking for sittings with the Queen Mother. He was very courteous and heard what I had to say and then responded in this manner. Mr Stone... The Queen Mother cannot sit for any Tom, Dick or Harry who happens to telephone her home to ask for sittings. Now, me sensing that I'm losing this opportunity to possibly paint Queen Elizabeth, I said, Lord Adam, that was his name, Lord Adam Gordon. I said, Lord Adam, I could be a Latter-day Rembrandt. Will you please look <laughs> at my work? The line went dead, but there was this little, little voice in my head which says, don't hang up. Yeah. And he came after what seemed like an eternity. <laughs> he said, Mr Stone, you're right, I haven't seen your work. Why don't you bring your portfolio to my office here at Clarence House next week. Wow. He saw my paintings, promptly commissioned a portrait of his wife, invited me to a cocktail party at his home that evening, where he said he could introduce me to people who might be helpful yeah. in persuading Queen Elizabeth to sit for her portrait. Yeah. The rest is history. Yeah. When they hear what he said about, we can't let any Tom, Dick or Harry do a portrait, most people would probably go, okay, no worries, bye. What made you want to pursue it still? I have no idea. I'm actually <laughs> quite a shy person. And what possessed me on that occasion, I don't know. The fact that I'd held onto this dream since I was so young, always wanting to become a portrait painter and firmly believing that those artists that have been successful 
both in history and to the present day, that the very pinnacle of their career has always been to paint a royal portrait, and in particular, the portrait of the monarch. Yeah. If you think back in history, we only know what Henry VIII brought back by Holbein's fabulous portraits. Yeah. We only know what Charles I brought back by those beautiful pictures painted by Van Dyck. So from a very early age, that was my ambition. Um, and along the way, there have been people who have certainly trusted me, believed in me, mm. and I'm extraordinarily lucky. And you've now painted the portraits of two monarchs, I suppose, Queen Elizabeth II and King Charles III. Does the Charles one count because he wasn't a monarch at the time? And wasn't expected to be for a very long time. Um, the two portraits were actually painted quite some time ago now. Um, but he is such a wonderful person to be with. Yeah. What's so nice about the many sittings I've had with him is that we're able to talk about art. And remember, he's a, an extremely accomplished watercolorist. Mm -hmm. And I actually freely admit I can't get along with the watercolor. <laughs> so we would have conversations about the pleasure of hearing him talk about his sketches and me talking about my work using oil colour. It was lovely to have a very pleasant exchange talking about the, the different medium that we've been using and genuine enthusiastic conversation as well. I suppose he probably prefers paintbrushes to leaky pens. There is that. <laughs> In your childhood, you had a bit of a tumble, which resulted in you being deaf for a while, but you think that probably helped you a bit in terms of portraits because it made you study people's facial expressions a bit more. Gosh, you have been doing your research. <laughs> in six months of the incident outside Buckingham Palace when I was four, to be accurate, it was Boxing Day and time to go to bed in mm. those days. Um, I'd be packed off to bed at seven o'clock in the evening and my mother was carrying my baby brother upstairs in front of me and she asked me to follow her. Yeah. I happened to be wearing my slippers, which were the birthday, uh, the Christmas gift that year. I'd forgotten Teddy. I told my mother I'd forgotten my favourite toy and she says, don't worry, keep coming upstairs and I'll get Teddy for you. Well, being of an independent mind, I turned and decided to get Teddy myself. But as I turned, I placed one foot over the other, wearing unfamiliar slippers, tumbled downstairs and hit my head rather badly on the stone floor of the hall. Mm -hmm. I'd fractured my skull. These were the days when it wasn't commonplace to have a phone in the home. So my father had to dash to the public call box to dial 999. And I was rushed to hospital. Things were serious. I was in a coma for three months. Wow. Parents were being gently prepared that I'd be severely brain damaged. It must have been a terrible time for them. But actually, when I surfaced from my coma, to everyone's surprise, I wasn't brain damaged. But actually, I was completely deaf. Mm -hmm. Totally deaf. I couldn't hear anything. But as I gradually recovered, I was sent off to school as it happened next in primary school, and was totally unteachable. I couldn't hear what people were saying. And so the teachers would just give me paper and pencils and a lot of paint and a handful of brushes. And in effect, I just had to get on with it. Mm. And what did I do? I filled my day with painting what was around me and people around me. But trying to understand what was going on around me I would look intently at people's faces. Were they trying to help me or were they trying to tell me off? Yeah. So you can see from that stage in my life, my skill at observing things in great detail was so necessary that thinking back, it has helped me enormously to become a painter. I have this ability to, if you want, have an enhanced ability to observe things in minute detail. Yeah. And as a result of that awful accident, it has, looking back, helped me enormously realise my, my ambition. Yeah. 
and your accent as well is not what you would have had if you hadn't have been deaf right because you couldn't pick up the accent of course because you were deaf so you ended up picking up received pronunciation you're correct I, I would make regular visits to the deaf clinic yeah and in order that um, there was a process of my rehabilitation if you want mm. they they taught me how to pronounce words again and so I would have lessons in speaking over a balloon so the vibrations would give me a sense of the shape of my lips. Mm. It changed my accent considerably. And yes, it was it was RP. It was received pronunciation. I suppose that's what radio announcers <laughs> yeah. taught in the, in the day. Yeah. And in some ways that too helped me because... I came from a, a very ordinary working class background. Mm. Um, I make no bones about it. It was very humble, but I, it, I came from a, a good, honest, solid family. My father was the local postman. And there were certainly no social connections that could possibly help me realize my ambition. Yeah. We didn't have pictures on the wall. I didn't have art books. But in many ways, I think it has helped me have an, oh, isn't it awful to say it, an accent that gave me a passport mm. to a much more middle-class acceptance. That's a terrible thing to say, really, and I, yeah. I'm a bit of embarrassed to sort of have to identify it. Yeah. But I know it has helped me because I was invited um, to larger houses, if you want, that yeah. people showing an interest in my work from a very early age. And because I spoke like people who were privately educated and could mix, for the most part, quite comfortably with them, I was given opportunities and commissions to draw people. And it was the beginning of, if you want, a, a, a career which has ultimately ended up with me mixing with the grandest people and in the highest possible circles. Who's your favourite of all the people you've done a portrait for? It's very hard to identify just one person. There is definitely a sort of top ten. <laughs> it has to be, without doubt, the Queen Mother for plucking me from obscurity and telling her family and friends that I would starve unless they gave me commissions. Yeah. But along the way, I'd painted Nelson Mandela. Yeah. He called me in my studio one wet Saturday afternoon to say that he was going to be celebrating his 90th birthday in London and could I paint his portrait for the event. Wow. But to spend time with one of the very great men of, of the time um, has been life-changing. Um, I love music, so uh, to have been commissioned to paint Luciano Pavarotti, Joan mm. Sutherland for Australia, um, very people who are iconic but have been recognised as extraordinary people in history. Um, so that top ten actually probably is the short list. Yeah. But along the way, I have been extraordinarily fortunate to have met amazing people and the best bit, to have learnt from them as well. Yeah. A lot of these people are sadly no longer with us. So is there a sense of you're quite glad that you did it because you wouldn't have the chance anymore? You're right. Being a portrait painter, I'm, I've always felt no matter whether the per person is famous or not, I am still painting for history. Mm. That the likeness, whether you're famous or not, is going to be something that is going to be treasured, possibly revered by the family. Yeah. And often in the case of a very famous person, it's going to be a portrait that posterity is going to remember them by. Mm. And given the enormous publicity that my first portrait of the Queen has attracted, I now realise that it most definitely is a portrait painted for posterity. And how do you feel about that? Because of course we've got photography now, whereas we didn't have that 
back in the days of King Henry VIII. But do you still feel that in years to come, we'll look back on these kings and queens from today and look at the portraits still? Yes, most definitely. Because in this age, the age of, of the camera, it's very easy to think that the camera can capture something of someone's personality. But it, mm. it can't, because it is literally a nanosecond in time. Yeah. And the special circumstance of a portrait is that it is a carefully considered record of a number and a combination of many, many observations made by the artist over a period of hours. Mm. So if one's to judge a good portrait, first of all, it's got to be an accurate likeness. But if you can stand in front of that portrait and look at it and feel the presence of that person, you get a sense of their spirit, then yeah. it does make that a good portrait. And I think that's why portraits will always be valued. Now, of course, your 1992 portrait of the Queen was used by the BBC on the announcement of her death and in subsequent obituary broadcasts. How does that make you feel to have your portrait used for something so big? Goosebumps. Even you mentioning it now, absolute goosebumps. When the portrait was painted, um, I was relatively happy with it, but one always goes into periods of anxiety afterwards. Could I have done something better? But given the 30 years since I painted that portrait and now receiving a response from many, many people looking at that picture, certainly being affected by the news that the Queen is no longer with us. Yeah. The fact that people are moved by it and recognise a quality in it that they can connect with. If I've painted a, a legacy picture, then I suppose I've done that. Mm. But it's really required, I suppose hearing what other people say about it that has confirmed that. I'm hugely moved by the response. And that's helped me in so many ways cope with the enormous sadness yeah. and genuine upset that I felt that the Queen has passed away. Yeah. Are you still doing portraits of people at the moment? Oh, yes. I, I, I would never stop. Yeah. Um, the word retirement is not in my vocabulary at all. Yeah. I love painting. I love meeting people. I love hearing their stories. I learn a lot by talking to people. I get mm. inspired by talking to people. That's what motivates me. And it is a huge pleasure to have the privilege of a talent. Yeah. Um, a paint box that gives me a passport to other people's lives. And and I enjoy every single second of it. Is there anyone's portrait you're working on at the moment or are you not allowed to say? I'm not allowed to say. <laughs> Look at the newspapers later on. <laughs> OK, well, where are we able to keep up to date with you and, of course, find all your portraits? Well, there always oh, sounds terrible advertising here. There's... <laughs> Always my website and yes. there's always Twitter. Excellent. Well, many thanks for joining us today. It's been great to talk to you. It's been a huge pleasure to speak to you and thank you for your time. It's been lovely to share memories and I have enjoyed answering your questions.